The Guatemalan Civil War ran from 1960 to 1996. It was fought between the government of Guatemala and various leftist rebel groups supported chiefly by ethnic Maya indigenous people and Ladino peasants, who together make up the rural poor. The government forces of Guatemala have been condemned for committing genocide against the Maya population of Guatemala during the civil war and for widespread human rights violations against civilians. Democratic elections during the Guatemalan Revolution in 1944 and 1951 had brought popular leftist governments to power, but a United States backed coup d'etat in 1954 installed the military regime of Carlos Castillo Armas, who was followed by a series of conservative military dictators. In 1970, Colonel Carlos Manuel Arana Osorio became the first of a series of military dictators representing the Institutional Democratic Party or PID. The PID dominated Guatemalan politics for 12 years through electoral frauds favoring two of Col. Carlos Arana's protégés Gen. K. Gel Eugenio Logarud Garcia in 1974 and General Romeo Lucas Garcia in 1978. The PID lost its grip on Guatemalan politics when General Efrain Rees Mont, together with a group of junior army officers, seized power in a military coup on 23 March 1982. In the 1970s continuing social discontent gave rise to an insurgency among the large populations of indigenous people and peasants, who traditionally bore the brunt of unequal land tenure. During the 1980s, the Guatemalan military assumed almost absolute government power for five years, it had successfully infiltrated and eliminated enemies in every socio-political institution of the nation, including the political, social, and intellectual classes. In the final stage of the civil war, the military developed a parallel, semi-visible, low-profile but high-effect, control of Guatemala's national life. It is estimated that 200,000 people were killed or disappeared during the conflict. As well as fighting between government forces and rebel groups, the conflict included, much more significantly, a large-scale, coordinated campaign of one-sided violence by the Guatemalan state against the civilian population from the mid-1960s onward. The military intelligence services G2 or S2 and an affiliated intelligence organization known as La Regional or Archivo, headquartered in an annex of the presidential palace, were responsible for coordinating killings and disappearances of opponents of the state and suspected insurgents and those deemed by the intelligence services to be collaborators. The Guatemalan state was the first in Latin America to engage in widespread use of forced disappearances against its opposition with the number of disappeared estimated at between 40,000 and 50,000 from 1966 until the end of the war. In rural areas where the insurgency maintained its strongholds, the repression amounted to wholesale slaughter of the peasantry and massacres of entire villages, first in the departments of Isabel and Zachapa (1966–68), and later in the predominantly Mayan western highlands from 1978 onward. In the early 1980s, the killings are considered to have taken on the scale of genocide. Most human rights abuses were at the hands of the military, police and intelligence services. Victims of the repression included indigenous activists, suspected government opponents, returning refugees, critical academics, students, left-leaning politicians, trade unionists, religious workers, journalists, and street children. The Commission para el Esclarecimiento Histórico has estimated that 93% of human rights abuses in the conflict have been committed by government forces and 3% by the guerrillas. 
In 2009, Guatemalan court sentenced Felipe Cusanero as the first person convicted of the crime of ordering forced disappearances. This was followed by the 2013 genocide trial of former President Efrain Rees Mont for the killing and disappearances of more than 1,700 indigenous Ixal Maya during his 1982 83 rule. The accusations of genocide derived from the Memoria del Silencio. Report, written by the UN appointed Commission for Historical Clarification, which considered that genocide could have occurred in Quiche between 1981 and 1983, although it did not take into consideration potential economic interests in the Ixcan region, situated in Franja Transversal del Norte, given the oil fields that were discovered in that area in 1975. The first former head of state to be tried for genocide by his own country's judicial system, Mont was found guilty the day following the conclusion of his trial and was sentenced to 80 years in prison. A few days later, however, the sentence was reversed by the country's high court and the trial was scheduled to start again because of alleged judicial anomalies. The trial began again on 23 July 2015 but did not reach a verdict before the Mont's death on 1 April 2018. Topic. Background After the 1871 revolution, the liberal government of Justo Rufino Barrios escalated coffee production in Guatemala, which required much land and many workers. To find the people needed for the work, Barrios established the Settler Rule Book, which forced the native population to work for low wages for the landowners, who were Criollos and later German settlers. Barrios also confiscated the common native land, which had been protected during the Spanish colony and during the conservative government of Rafael Carrera, and distributed to his liberal friends, who became important landowners. In the 1890s, the United States began to implement the Monroe Doctrine, pushing out European colonial powers and establishing U.S. hegemony over resources and labor in Latin American nations. The dictators that ruled Guatemala during the late 19th and early 20th centuries were very accommodating to U.S. business and political interests. Unlike other Latin American nations, such as Haiti, Nicaragua and Cuba, the U.S. did not have to use overt military force to maintain dominance in Guatemala. The Guatemalan military, police worked closely with the U.S. military and State Department to secure U.S. interests. The Guatemalan government exempted several U.S. corporations from paying taxes, especially the United Fruit Company. It also privatized and sold off publicly owned utilities, and gave away huge swaths of public land. Topic. Societal structure In 1920, Prince Wilhelm of Sweden visited Guatemala and described Guatemalan society and Estrada Cabrera government in his book Between Two Continents, Notes from a Journey in Central America, 1920. The prince explained the dynamics of the Guatemalan society at the time pointing out that even though it called itself a republic, Guatemala had three sharply defined classes. Criollos, a minority conformed originally by ancient families descendants of the Spaniards that conquered Central America and that by 1920 comprised both political parties in the country. By 1920, they were mixed to a large extent with foreigners and the great majority had some Indian ancestry. 
They led the country both politically and intellectually, partly because their education, although poor for European standards of the time, was far superior to that of the rest of the people of the country, partly because only Criollos were allowed in the main political parties, and also partly because their families controlled and, for the most part, owned the cultivated parts of the country. Ladinos, middle class Formed of people born of the cross between natives, blacks and criollos, they held almost no political power in 1920 and made up the bulk of artisans, storekeepers, tradesmen and minor officials. In the eastern part of the country they were agricultural laborers. Indians, the majority of the population was composed of native Guatemalans, many of whom had little to no formal education. Many natives served as soldiers for the army, and they were often raised to positions of considerable trust. They made the main element in the working agricultural population. There were three categories within them. Mozos Colonos settled on the plantations, were given a small piece of land to cultivate on their own account, in return for work in the plantations so many months of the year. Mozos jornaleros, day laborers who were contracted to work for certain periods of time. They were paid a daily wage, in theory, each. Mozo was free to dispose of his labor as he or she pleased, but they were bound to the property by economical ties. They could not leave until they had paid off their debt to the owner, and they were victim of those owners, who encouraged the mozos to get into debt beyond their power to free themselves by granting credit or lending cash. If the mozos ran away, the owner could have them pursued and imprisoned by the authorities, with all the cost incurred in the process charged to the ever-increasing debt of the mozo. If one of them refused to work, he or she was put in prison on the spot. Finally, the wages were extremely low. The work was done by contract, but since every mozo Starts with a large debt, the usual advance on engagement, they become servants to the owner. 4. Independent tillers, living in the most remote provinces, survived by growing crops of maize, wheat or beans, sufficient to meet their own needs and leave a small margin for disposal in the marketplaces of the towns and often carried their goods on their back for up to 25 miles a day. Topic. Jorge Ubico regime In 1931, the dictator General Jorge Ubico came to power, backed by the United States. While an efficient administrator, he initiated one of the most brutally repressive military regimes in Central American history. Just as Estrada Cabrera had done during his government, Ubico created a widespread network of spies and informants and had political opponents tortured and put to death. A wealthy aristocrat with an estimated income of $215,000 per year in 1930s dollars and a staunch anti-communist, he consistently sided with the United Fruit Company, Guatemalan landowners and urban elites in disputes with peasants. After the crash of the New York Stock Exchange in 1929, the peasant system established by Barrios in 1875 to jump start coffee production in the country faltered, and Ubico was forced to implement a system of debt slavery and forced labor to make sure that there was enough labor available for the coffee plantations and that the UFCO workers were readily available. Allegedly, he passed laws allowing landowners to execute workers as a disciplinary measure. He also identified as a fascist. He admired Mussolini, Franco, and Hitler, saying at one point, I am like Hitler. I execute first and ask questions later. Ubico was disdainful of the indigenous population, calling them animal like 
and stated that to become civilized, they needed mandatory military training, comparing it to domesticating donkeys. He gave away hundreds of thousands of hectares to the United Fruit Company UFCO, exempted them from taxes in Tikazate, and allowed the U.S. military to establish bases in Guatemala. Ubico considered himself to be another Napoleon. He dressed ostentatiously and surrounded himself with statues and paintings of the emperor, regularly commenting on the similarities between their appearances. He militarized numerous political and social institutions, including the post office, schools, and even symphony orchestras, and placed military officers in charge of many government posts. He frequently traveled around the country performing inspections in dress uniform, followed by a military escort, a mobile radio station, an official biographer, and cabinet members. After 14 years, Ubico's repressive policies and arrogant demeanor finally led to pacific disobedience by urban middle class intellectuals, professionals, and junior army officers in 1944. On 1 July 1944 Ubico resigned from office amidst a general strike and nationwide protests. He had planned to hand over power to the former director of police, General Roderico Anzueto, whom he felt he could control. But his advisers noted that Anzueto's pro-Nazi sympathies had made him unpopular, and that he would not be able to control the military. So Ubico instead chose to select a triumvirate of Major General Buenaventura Pineda, Major General Eduardo Villagrón Ariza, and General Federico Ponce Vides. The three generals promised to convene the National Assembly to hold an election for a provisional president, but when the Congress met on 3 July, soldiers held everyone at gunpoint and forced them to vote for General Ponce rather than the popular civilian candidate, Dr. Ramon Calderón. Ponce, who had previously retired from military service due to alcoholism, took orders from Ubico and kept many of the officials who had worked in the Ubico administration. The repressive policies of the Ubico administration were continued. Opposition groups began organizing again, this time joined by many prominent political and military leaders, who deemed the Ponce regime unconstitutional. Among the military officers in the opposition were Jacobo Orbenz and Major Francisco Javier Arana. Ubico had fired Orbenz from his teaching post at the Escuela Politécnica, and since then Orbenz had been living in El Salvador, organizing a band of revolutionary exiles. On 19 October 1944 a small group of soldiers and students led by Orbenz and Arana attacked the National Palace in what later became known as the October Revolution. Ponce was defeated and driven into exile, and Orbenz, Arana, and a lawyer named Jorge Torriello established a junta. They declared that democratic elections would be held before the end of the year. The winner of the 1944 elections was a teaching major named Juan Jose Arevalo, Ph.D., who had earned a scholarship in Argentina during the government of General Lazaro Chacon due to his superb professor skills. Arevalo remained in South America during a few years, working as a university professor in several countries. Back in Guatemala during the early years of the Jorge Ubico regime, his colleagues asked him to present a project to the president to create the Faculty of Humanism at the National University, to which Ubico was strongly opposed. Realizing the dictatorial nature of Ubico, Arevalo left Guatemala and went back to Argentina. He went back to Guatemala after the 1944 revolution and ran under a coalition of leftist parties known as the Partido Acción Revolucionaria, Revolutionary Action Party, 
par, and won 85% of the vote in elections that are widely considered to have been fair and open. Arevalo implemented social reforms, including minimum wage laws, increased educational funding, near universal suffrage, excluding illiterate women, and labor reforms. But many of these changes only benefited the upper middle classes and did little for the peasant agricultural laborers who made up the majority of the population. Although his reforms were relatively moderate, he was widely disliked by the United States government, the Catholic Church, large landowners, employers such as the United Fruit Company, and Guatemalan military officers, who viewed his government as inefficient, corrupt, and heavily influenced by communists. At least 25 coup attempts took place during his presidency, mostly led by wealthy liberal military officers. In 1944, the October Revolutionaries took control of the government. They instituted liberal economic reform, benefiting and politically strengthening the civil and labor rights of the urban working class and the peasants. Elsewhere, a group of leftist students, professionals, and liberal democratic government coalitions developed, led by Juan José Arevalo and Jacobo Orbenz Guzmán. Decree 900, passed in 1952, ordered the redistribution of fallow land on large estates, threatening the interests of the landowning elite and, mainly, the United Fruit Company. Given the strong ties of the UFCO with high Eisenhower administration officers such as brothers John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles who were Secretary of State and CIA Director, respectively who were in the company board, the U.S. government ordered the Central Intelligence Agency to launch Operation PBFORTUNE and halt Guatemala's communist revolt as perceived by the corporate fruit company United Fruit and the U.S. State Department. The CIA chose right-wing Guatemalan Army Colonel Carlos Castillo Armas to lead an «insurrection» in the 1954 Guatemalan coup d'état. Upon deposing the Orbenz Guzmán government, Castillo Armas began to dissolve a decade of social and economic reform and legislative progress, and banned labor unions and left wing political parties, a disfranchisement of left wing Guatemalans. He also returned all the confiscated land to the United Fruit and the elite landlords. A series of military coups d'état followed, featuring fraudulent elections in which only military personnel were the winner candidates. Aggravating the general poverty and political repression motivating the civil war was the widespread socio-economic discrimination and racism practiced against the Guatemala's indigenous peoples, such as the Maya, many later fought in the civil war. Although the indigenous Guatemalans constitute more than half of the national populace, they were landless, having been dispossessed of their lands since the Justo Rufino Barrios times. The landlord upper classes of the oligarchy, generally descendants of Spanish and other European immigrants to Guatemala, although often with some mestizo ancestry as well, controlled most of the land after the liberal reform of 1871. Topic. Initial phase of the Civil War, 1960s and early 1970s On 13 November 1960, a group of left-wing junior military officers of the Escuela Politécnica National Military Academy led a failed revolt against the autocratic government 1958 of General Edigras Fuentes, who had usurped power in 1958, after the assassination of the incumbent Colonel Castillo Armas. 
The young officers were outraged by the staggering corruption of the Idigoras regime, the government's showing of favoritism in military promotions and in providing other rewards to officers who supported Idigoras, and what they perceived as incompetence in running the country. The immediate trigger for their revolt, however, was Idigaris's decision to allow the United States to train an invasion force in Guatemala to prepare for the planned Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba without consulting the Guatemalan military and without sharing with the military the payoff he received in exchange from the U.S. government. The military was concerned about the infringement on the sovereignty of the country as unmarked U.S. warplanes piloted by U.S.-based Cuban exiles flew in large numbers over the country and the U.S. established a secret airstrip and training camp at Ritalaleu to prepare for its invasion of Cuba. The rebellion was not ideological in its origins. The U.S. Central Intelligence Agency (CIA) flew B-26 bombers disguised as Guatemalan military jets to bomb the rebel bases because the coup threatened U.S. plans for the invasion of Cuba as well as the Guatemalan regime it supported. The rebels fled to the hills of eastern Guatemala and neighboring Honduras and formed the colonel of what became known as Mr. 13. The surviving officers fled into the hills of eastern Guatemala, and later established communication with the Cuban government of Fidel Castro. By 1962, those surviving officers had established an insurgent movement known as the Mr. 13 Movimiento Revolucionario 13 Novembre, named after the date of the officers' revolt. Topic: <laughs> Mr. 13 attacks United Fruit Company office. In early 1962 they returned and on 6 February 1962 in Bananera they attacked the offices of the United Fruit Company, present-day Chiquita Brands, an American corporation that controlled vast territories in Guatemala as well as in other Central American countries. The attack sparked sympathetic strikes and university student walkouts throughout the country, to which the Idigoras regime responded with a violent crackdown. This violent crackdown sparked the civil war. Through the early phase of the conflict, the Mr. 13 was a principal component of the insurgent movement in Guatemala. The Mr. 13 later initiated contact with the outlawed PGT Guatemalan Labour Party, composed and led by middle-class intellectuals and students, and a student organization called the Movimiento 12 de Abril April 12th movement, and together with these groups merged into a coalition guerrilla organization called the Rebel Armed Forces FAR, in December 1962. Also affiliated with the FAR was the FGEI Edgar Ibarra Guerrilla Front. The Mr. 13, PGT and the FGEI each operated in different parts of the country as three separate frentes. Fronts, the Mr. 13 established itself in the mostly Ladino departments of Isabel and Zachapa, the FGEI established itself in Sierra de las Minas and the PGT operated as an urban guerrilla front. Each of these three frentes, comprising no more than 500 combatants, were led by former members of the 1960 Army Revolt, who had previously been trained in counterinsurgency warfare by the United States. <laughs> U.S. intelligence and counterinsurgency assistance to government In 1964 and 1965, the Guatemalan Armed Forces began engaging in counterinsurgency actions against the Mr. 13 in eastern Guatemala. In February and March 1964, the Guatemalan Air Force began a selective bombing campaign against Mr. 13 bases in Isabel, which was followed by counterinsurgency sweeps in the neighboring province of Zachapa under the code name. 
Operation Falcon in September and October 1965. These operations were supplemented by increased U.S. military assistance. Beginning in 1965, the U.S. government sent Green Berets and CIA advisors to instruct the Guatemalan military in counterinsurgency anti-guerrilla warfare. In addition, U.S. police and «public safety» advisors were dispatched to reorganize the urban security structures. In response to increased insurgent activity in the capital, a specialty squad of the National Police was organized in June 1965 called Commando Cease Commando 6 to deal with urban guerrilla assaults. Commando 6 received special training from the U.S. Public Safety Program and money and weapons from U.S. Public Safety Advisors. In November 1965, U.S. Public Safety Advisor John Longan arrived in Guatemala on temporary loan from his post in Venezuela to assist senior military and police officials in establishing an urban counterinsurgency program. With the assistance of Longan, the Guatemalan military launched Operation Limpieza. Operation Cleanup, an urban counterinsurgency program under the command of Colonel Rafael Arriaga Bosque. This program coordinated the activities of all of the country's main security agencies including the Army, the Judicial Police and the National Police in both covert and overt anti-guerrilla operations. Under Arage's direction, the security forces began to abduct, torture and kill the PGT's key constituents, with money and support from U.S. advisors. President Enrique Peralta Azadia established a presidential intelligence agency in the National Palace, under which a telecommunications database known as the Regional Telecommunications Center or La Regional existed, linking the National Police, the Treasury Guard, the Judicial Police, the Presidential House and the Military Communications Center via a VHFFM intracity frequency. La Regional also served as a depository for the names of suspected subversives and had its own intelligence and operational unit attached to it known as the Policia Regional. This network was built on the Committees Against Communism created by the Central Intelligence Agency after the coup in 1954. Topic. Escalation of state terror On 3 and 5 March 1966, the G2 military intelligence and the judicial police raided three houses in Guatemala City, capturing 28 trade unionists and members of the PGT. Those captured included most of the PGT's Central Committee and Peasant Federation leader Leonardo Castillo Flores. All subsequently disappeared while in the custody of the security force and became known in subsequent months by the Guatemalan press as the 28. This incident was followed by a wave of unexplained disappearances and killings in Guatemala City and in the countryside which were reported by the Guatemala City Press. When press censorship was lifted for a period, relatives of the 28 and of others who had disappeared in the Zashapa Isabel military zone went to the press or to the Association of University Students AEU. Using its legal department, the AEU subsequently pressed for habeas corpus on behalf of the disappeared persons. The government denied any involvement in the killings and disappearances. On 16 July 1966, the AEU published a detailed report on abuses in the last months of the Peralta regime in which it named 35 individuals as involved in killings and disappearances, including military commissioners and members of the Ambulant Military Police PMA, in coordination with the G2. After the publication of this report, Death Squad 
Attacks on the AEU and on the University of San Carlos began to intensify. Many law students and members of the AEU were assassinated. The use of such tactics increased dramatically after the inauguration of President Julio Cesar Mendes Montenegro, who, in a bid to placate and secure the support of the military establishment, gave it carte blanche to engage in any means necessary to pacify the country. The military subsequently ran the counterinsurgency program autonomously from the presidential house and appointed Vice Defense Minister, Col. Manuel Francisco Sosa Avila as the main counterinsurgency coordinator. In addition, the Army General Staff and the Ministry of Defense took control of the Presidential Intelligence Agency, which controlled the La Regional Annex, and renamed it the Guatemalan National Security Service Servicio de Seguridad Nacional de Guatemala, SSNG, in the city and in the countryside. Persons suspected of leftist sympathies began to disappear or turn up dead at an unprecedented rate. In the countryside most disappearances and killings were carried out by uniformed army patrols and by locally known PMA or military commissioners, while in the cities the abductions and disappearances were usually carried out by heavily armed men in plain clothes, operating out of army and police installations. The army and police denied responsibility, pointing the finger at right-wing paramilitary death squads autonomous from the government. One of the most notorious death squads operating during this period was the Mano, also known as the Mano Blanca, White Hand. Initially formed by the MLN as a paramilitary front in June 1966 to prevent President Mendes Montenegro from taking office, the Mano was quickly taken over by the military and incorporated into the state's counter-terror apparatus. The Mano, while being the only death squad formed autonomously from the government, had a largely military membership, and received substantial funding from wealthy landowners. The Mano also received information from military intelligence through La Regional, with which it was linked to the Army General Staff and all of the main security forces. The first leaflets by the Mano appeared on 3 June 1966 in Guatemala City, announcing the impending creation of the White Hand, or the hand that will eradicate national renegades and traitors to the fatherland. In August 1966, Mano leaflets were distributed over Guatemala City by way of light aircraft openly landing in the Air Force section of La Aurora Air Base. The main message was that all patriotic citizens must fully support the Army's counterinsurgency initiative and that the Army was the institution of the greatest importance at any latitude, representative of authority, of order, and of respect, and that to attack it, divide it, or to wish its destruction is indisputably treason to the fatherland. Topic: <laughs> Counterterror in Zashapa. With increased military aid from the United States, the 5,000-man Guatemalan army mounted a large pacification effort in the departments of Zashapa and Isabel in October 1966 dubbed Operation Guatemala. Colonel Carlos Arana Osorio was appointed commander of the Zashapa Isabel Military Zone and took charge of the counter-terror program with guidance and training from 1,000 U.S. Green Berets. Under Colonel Arana's jurisdiction, military strategists armed and fielded various paramilitary death squads to supplement regular army and police units in clandestine terror operations against the FAR's civilian support base. Personnel, weapons, funds and operational instructions were supplied to these organizations by the armed forces. 
The death squads operated with impunity, permitted by the government to kill any civilians deemed to be either insurgents or insurgent collaborators. The civilian membership of the army's paramilitary units consisted largely of right-wing fanatics with ties to the MLN, founded and led by Mario Sandoval Alacon, a former participant in the 1954 coup. By 1967, the Guatemalan army claimed to have 1,800 civilian paramilitaries under its direct control. Blacklists were compiled of suspected guerrilla collaborators and those with communist leanings, as troops and paramilitaries moved through Zashapa systematically arresting suspected insurgents and collaborators, prisoners were either killed on the spot or disappeared after being taken to clandestine detention camps for interrogation. In villages which the army suspected were pro-guerrilla, the army rounded up all of the peasant leaders and publicly executed them, threatening to kill additional civilians if the villagers did not cooperate with the authorities. In a 1976 report, Amnesty International cited estimates that up to 8,000 peasants were killed by the army and paramilitary organizations in Zashapa between October 1966 and March 1968. Other estimates put the death toll at 15,000 in Zashapa during the Mendez period. As a result, Colonel Arana Osorio subsequently earned the nickname, The Butcher of Zashapa, for his brutality. Topic. State of siege On 2 November 1966 a nationwide state of siege was declared in Guatemala in which civil rights, including the right to habeas corpus, were suspended. The entire security apparatus, including local police and private security guards, was subsequently placed under then Minister of Defense, Col. Rafael Arriaga Bosque. Press censorship was imposed alongside these security measures, including measures designed to keep the Zashapa campaign entirely shrouded in secrecy. These controls ensured that the only reports made public on the counter-terror program in Zashapa were those handed out by the Army's Public Relations Office. Also on the day of the State of Siege, a directive was published banning publication of reports on arrests until authorization by military authorities. At the time of the Zashapa campaign, the government launched a parallel counter terror program in the cities. Part of this new initiative was the increased militarization of the police forces and the activation of several new counter-terror units of the Army and the National Police for performing urban counter-terror functions, particularly extralegal activities against opponents of the state. The National Police were subsequently transformed into an adjunct of the military and became a frontline force in the government's urban pacification program against the left. In January 1967, the Guatemalan Army formed the Special Commando Unit of the Guatemalan Army, a 35 man commando unit composed of anti communist army officers and right wing civilians, which was placed under the command of Colonel Morshimo Zapeda. The SCUGA, which the CIA referred to as a government sponsored terrorist organization, used primarily for assassinations and political abductions, carried out abductions, bombings, street assassinations, torture, disappearances and summary executions of both real and suspected communists. The SCUGA also worked with the Mano Blanca for a period before inter-agency rivalry took over. In March 1967, after Vice Defense Minister and Counterinsurgency Coordinator Col. 
Francisco Sosa Avila was named Director General of the National Police, a special counterinsurgency unit of the National Police known as the Fourth Corps was created to carry out extralegal operations alongside the SCUGA. The Fourth Corps was an illegal 50-man assassination squad which operated in secrecy from other members of the National Police, taking orders from Col. Sosa and Col. Ariaga, operations carried out under by the SCUGA and the 4th Corps were usually carried out under the guise of paramilitary fronts, such as RAYO, NOAA, CADEG and others. By 1967, at least 20 such death squads operated in Guatemala City which posted blacklists of suspected «communists» who were then targeted for murder. These lists were often published with police mugshots and passport photographs which were only accessible to the Ministry of the Interior. In January 1968, a booklet containing 85 names was distributed throughout the country entitled People of Guatemala, Know the Traitors, the Guerrillas of the FAR. Many of those named in the booklet were killed or forced to flee. Death threats and warnings were sent to both individuals and organizations, for example, a CADEG leaflet addressed to the leadership of the Labor Federation FECETRAG read, "'Your hour has come. Communists at the service of Fidel Castro, Russia and Communist China. You have until the last day of March to leave the country. Victims of government repression in the capital included guerrilla sympathizers, labor union leaders, intellectuals, students, and other vaguely defined enemies of the government. Some observers referred to the policy of the Guatemalan government as white terror. A term previously used to describe similar periods of anti-communist mass killing in countries such as Taiwan and Spain, by the end of 1967, the counterinsurgency program had resulted in the virtual defeat of the far insurgency in Zaxapa and Isabel and the retreat of many of its members to Guatemala City. President Méndez Montenegro suggested in his annual message to Congress in 1967 that the insurgents had been defeated. Despite the defeat of the insurgency, the government killings continued. In December 1967, 26-year-old Regilia Cruz Martínez, former Miss Guatemala of 1959, who was known for her left-wing sympathies, was picked up and found dead. Her body showed signs of torture, rape and mutilation. Amidst the outcry over the murder, the FAR opened fire on a carload of American military advisers on 16 January 1968. Colonel John D. Weber, chief of the U.S. military mission in Guatemala, and naval attaché Lieutenant Commander Ernest A. Munro were killed instantly, two others were wounded. The FAR subsequently issued a statement claiming that the killings were a reprisal against the Americans for creating genocidal forces, which had resulted in the death of nearly 4,000 Guatemalans during the previous two years. The kidnapping of Archbishop Casariego On 16 March 1968, kidnappers apprehended Roman Catholic Archbishop Mario Casariego y Acevedo within 100 yards of the National Palace in the presence of heavily armed troops and police. The kidnappers, possibly members of the security forces on orders from the Army High Command, intended to stage a false flag incident by implicating guerrilla forces in the kidnapping. The archbishop was well known for his extremely conservative views and it was considered that he might have organized a self-kidnapping 
to harm the reputation of the guerrillas. However he refused to go along with the scheme and his kidnappers plans to create a national crisis by appealing to the anti-communism of the Catholic population." The Archbishop was released unharmed after four days in captivity. In the aftermath of the incident, two civilians involved in the operation, Raúl Estuardo Lorenzana and Inés Mufio Padilla, were arrested and taken away in a police patrol car. In transit, the car stopped and the police officers exited the vehicle as gunmen sprayed it with submachine gun fire. One press report said Lorenzana's body had 27 bullet wounds and Padilla's 22. The police escorts were unharmed in the assassination. Raúl Lorenzana was a known front man for the Mano Death Squad and had operated out of the headquarters of the Guatemalan Army's Cuartel de Matamoros and a government safe house at La Aurora Air Base. The army was not left unscathed by the scandal and its three primary leaders of the counterinsurgency program were replaced and sent abroad. Defense Minister Rafael Arriaga Bosque was sent to Miami, Florida to become Consul General, Vice Defense Minister and Director General of the National Police, Col. Francisco Sosa Avila was dispatched as a military attaché to Spain and Col. Irana Osorio was sent as ambassador to Nicaragua, which was under the rule of Somoza at the time. Political murders by death squads declined in subsequent months and the state of siege was reduced to a state of alarm on the 24th of june 1968 topic the assassinations of ambassador john gordon mine and count carl von spretti The lull in political violence in the aftermath of the kidnapping of Archbishop Casariego ended after several months. On 28 August 1968, U.S. Ambassador John Gordon Mine was assassinated by far rebels one block from the U.S. consulate on Avenida Reforma in Guatemala City. U.S. officials believed that FAR intended to kidnap him in order to negotiate an exchange, but instead they shot him when he attempted to escape. Some sources suggested that the high command of the Guatemalan army was involved in the assassination of Ambassador Mine. This was alleged years later to U.S. investigators by a reputed former bodyguard of Col. Irana Osorio named Jorge Zimeri Safi, who had fled to the U.S. in 1976 and had been arrested on firearms charges in 1977. The Guatemalan police claimed to have solved the crime almost immediately, announcing that they had located a suspect on the same day. The suspect Michel Furk, a French socialist who had rented the car used to kidnap mine, shot herself as police came to interrogate her. In her notebook Michel had written, The assassination of Ambassador Mine led to public calls for tougher counterinsurgency measures by the military and an increase in U.S. security assistance. This was followed by a renewed wave of death squad killings of members of the opposition under the guise of new defense minister col rolando chinchilla aguilar and army chief of staff col doroteo reyes who were both subsequently promoted to the rank of general in september 1968 on 31 March 1970 West German Ambassador Count Karl von Spretti was kidnapped when his car was intercepted by armed men belonging to the FAR. The FAR subsequently put out a ransom note in which they demanded $700,000 ransom and the release of 17 political prisoners which was eventually brought up to 25. 
The Mendez government refused to cooperate with the FAR, causing outrage among the diplomatic community and the German government. Ten days later on 9 April 1970, von Spreti was found dead after an anonymous phone call was made disclosing the whereabouts of his remains. Topic: <laughs> Domination by military rulers. In July 1970, Colonel Carlos Arana Osorio assumed the presidency. Arana, backed by the army, represented an alliance of the MLN, the originators of the Mano Death Squad, and the Institutional Democratic Party MLN -PID. Irana was the first of a string of military rulers allied with the Institutional Democratic Party who dominated Guatemalan politics in the 1970s and 1980s, his predecessor, Julio César Méndez, while dominated by the army, was a civilian. Colonel Irana, who had been in charge of the terror campaign in Zashapa, was an anti-communist hardliner who once stated, if it is necessary to turn the country into a cemetery in order to pacify it, I will not hesitate to do so." Despite minimal armed insurgent activity at the time, Irana announced another, "...state of siege," on November 13, 1970 and imposed a curfew from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., during which time all vehicle and pedestrian traffic, including ambulances, fire engines, nurses, and physicians—were forbidden throughout the national territory. The siege was accompanied by a series of house-to-house -house searches by the police, which reportedly led to 1,600 detentions in the capital in the first 15 days of the state of siege. Irana also imposed dress codes, banning miniskirts for women and long hair for men. High government sources were cited at the time by foreign journalists as acknowledging 700 executions by security forces or paramilitary death squads in the first two months of the state of siege. This is corroborated by a January 1971 secret bulletin of the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency detailing the elimination of hundreds of suspected terrorists and bandits in the Guatemalan countryside by the security forces. While government repression continued in the countryside, the majority of victims of government repression under Irana were residents of the capital. Special commandos of the military and the 4th Corps of the National Police acting under government control but outside the judicial processes, abducted, tortured and killed thousands of leftists, students, labor union leaders and common criminals in Guatemala City. In November 1970, the judicial police were formally disbanded and a new semi-autonomous intelligence agency of the National Police was activated known as the Detectives Corps with members operating in plain clothes, which eventually became notorious for repression. One method of torture commonly used by the National Police at the time consisted of placing a rubber hood filled with insecticide over the victim's head to the point of suffocation some of the first victims of Irana's state of siege were his critics in the press and in the university in Guatemala City on the 26th of November 1970 security forces captured and disappeared journalists Enrique Salazar Solizano and Luis Perez Diaz in an apparent reprisal for newspaper stories condemning the repression on 27 November, National University law professor and government critic Julio Camey Herrera was found murdered. On the following day, radio station owner Humberto González Juárez, his business associate Armando Brand Val and a secretary disappeared, their bodies were subsequently found in a ravine. 
Later in 1975, a former member of the Detective Corps of the National Police, jailed for a non political murder, took credit for the killing. In October 1971, over 12,000 students at the University of San Carlos of Guatemala went on a general strike to protest the killing of students by the security forces. They called for an end to the state of siege. On 27 November 1971, the Guatemalan military responded with an extensive raid on the main campus of the university, seeking cached weapons. It mobilized 800 army personnel, as well as tanks, helicopters and armored cars, for the raid. They conducted a room-to-room -room search of the entire campus but found no evidence or supplies. A number of death squads, run by the police and intelligence services, emerged in the capital during this period. In one incident on the 13th of October 1972, 10 people were knifed to death in the name of a death squad known as the Avenging Vulture. Guatemalan government sources confirmed to the U.S. Department of State that the Avenging Vulture and other similar death squads operating during the time period were a smoke screen for extralegal tactics being employed by the national police against non political delinquents. Another infamous death squad active during this time was the A Joe Poor A Joe Eye for an Eye, described in a U.S. State Department intelligence cable as a largely military membership with some civilian cooperation. The A Joe Poor A Joe tortured, killed, and mutilated scores of civilians linked to the PGT or suspected of collaborating with the FAR in the first half of the 1970s, according to Amnesty International and domestic human rights organizations such as Committee of Relatives of Disappeared Persons. Over 7,000 civilian opponents of the security forces were disappeared or found dead in 1970 and 1970. 71, followed by an additional 8,000 in 1972 and 1973. In the period between January and September 1973, the Guatemalan Human Rights Commission documented the deaths and forced disappearances of 1,314 individuals by death squads. The Guatemalan Human Rights Commission estimated 20,000 people killed or disappeared between 1970 and 1974 amnesty international mentioned guatemala as one of several countries under a human rights state of emergency while citing the high incidence of disappearances of guatemalan citizens as a major and continuing problem in its 1972-1973 annual report Overall, as many as 42,000 Guatemalan civilians were killed or disappeared between 1966 and 1973. Topic: <laughs> Franja Transversal del Norte. The first settler project in the FTN was in Cebol, China, in Alta Verapaz. Sabol, then regarded as a strategic point and route through Cancuane River, which communicated with Petain through the Asamacinta River on the border with Mexico and the only road that existed was a dirt one built by President Lazaro Chacon in 1928. In 1958, during the government of General Miguel Idigoras Fuentes the Inter-American Development Bank IDB financed infrastructure projects in Cebol. In 1960, then Army Captain Fernando Romeo Lucas Garcia inherited Sequixquib and Punta de Bolonco farms in northeastern Cebol. In 1963 he bought the farm, San Fernando. El Palma de Saju and finally bought the Sepur 
farm near San Fernando. During those years, Lucas was in the Guatemalan legislature and lobbied in Congress to boost investment in that area of the country. In those years, the importance of the region was in livestock, exploitation of precious export wood, and archaeological wealth. Timber contracts were granted to multinational companies such as Murphy Pacific Corporation from California, which invested $30 million for the colonization of southern Petain and Alta Verapaz, and formed the North Impulsadora Company. Colonization of the area was made through a process by which inhospitable areas of the FTN were granted to native peasants. In 1962, the DGAA became the National Institute of Agrarian Reform INTA, by Decree 1551 which created the Law of Agrarian Transformation. In 1964, INTA defined the geography of the FTN as the northern part of the departments of Huehuetenango, Quiche, Alta Verapaz and Isabel and that same year priests of the Marinal Order and the Order of the Sacred Heart began the first process of colonization, along with INTA, carrying settlers from Huehuetenango to the Ixcan sector in Quiche. The Northern Transversal Strip was officially created during the government of General Carlos Arana Osorio in 1970, by Legislative Decree 60-70, for agricultural development. Guerrilla Army of the Poor On January 19, 1972, members of a new Guatemalan guerrilla movement entered Ixcan, from Mexico, and were accepted by many farmers. In 1973, after an exploratory foray into the municipal seat of Cotzal, the insurgent group decided to set up camp underground in the mountains of Exoshiche, municipality of Chajul. In 1974, the insurgent guerrilla group held its first conference, where it defined its strategy of action for the coming months and called itself Guerrilla Army of the Poor Ejercito Guerrillero de los Pobres EGP. In 1975 the organization had spread around the area of the mountains of northern municipalities of Nebai and Chajul. As part of its strategy EGP decided to perpetrate notorious acts which also symbolized the establishment of a social justice against the inefficiency and ineffectiveness of the judicial and administrative state institutions. They also wanted that with these actions the indigenous rural population of the region identified with the insurgency, thus motivating them to join their ranks. As part of this plan it was agreed to do the so-called executions in order to determine who would be subject to execution. The EGP gathered complaints received from local communities. For example, they selected two victims, Guillermo Monzon, who was a military commissioner in Ixcan and José Luis Arenas, the largest landowner in the area, and who had been reported to the EGP for allegedly having land conflicts with neighboring settlements and abusing their workers. Topic. Mass Movement for Social Reforms, 1974–1976 For several years after the «state of siege», the insurgency was largely inactive, having been defeated and demoralized on all fronts. Massive economic inequality persisted, compounded by external factors such the 1973 oil crisis, which led to rising food prices, fuel shortages, and decreased agricultural output due to the lack of imported goods and petrol-based fertilizers. A blatant electoral fraud during the 1974 presidential elections favored coal. Irana's chosen successor, General K. Gel Eugenio Lorgarud Garcia, who had worked with Col. 
Irana in 1966 to 68 during the Zashapa counterterror program and was defense minister at the time of his nomination. Logarud, like his predecessor, represented the right-wing alliance between the MLN and the Institutional Democratic Party MLN-PID, this time against a center-left alliance promoting the ticket of Christian Democrat General José Efrain Rees Montt later president from 1982–83 and leftist economist Alberto Fuentes Moore. Inflation, imbalance, public outrage at the electoral fraud, and discontent with human rights violations generated widespread protest and civil disobedience. A mass movement emerged that persisted throughout much of the decade. Coinciding with the election of K. Gel Logarud was the rise to prominence of labor organizations in rural Guatemala, such as the Cook. When the Cook Committee for Peasant Unity first began organizing in the countryside in the early 1970s more than 300,000 rural peasants left the Guatemalan Altiplano every year to work on plantations on the Pacific coast to supplement their minuscule earnings. The Cook was the first Indian-led national labor organization and the first to unite Ladino workers and Indian farmers in a struggle for better working conditions. The growth of cooperatives could be attributed to the fact that the new military government, at least on the surface, appeared to support the establishment of cooperatives and unions to improve working conditions. Unlike Col. Irana, General Logarud did not begin his term with the use of military repression to consolidate power and began to try to negotiate solutions to labor disputes between unions and industries rather than silencing the workers through violence. The public support given to cooperatives under General Logarud prompted the U.S. Agency for International Development aid to grant Guatemala $4,500,000 to finance the purchase of fertilizers and other supplies, while the Inter-American Development Bank granted an additional $15 million for cooperative development. In early 1976, from the start however, there was an apparent dual nature to the support the government gave to the growth of cooperatives. This was evinced by the continued use of selective terror against rural cooperatives by the security forces and by previous statements made by General Logarud in which he had condemned cooperatives as a facade for Soviet communism. In addition, a series of guerrilla operations in Ixcan in 1975 precipitated a ruthless backlash from the government, in which many cooperative leaders were selected for assassination. Due to the fact that cooperatives had been largely drawn out into the open, the names of cooperativists could easily be collated in order to designate targets for the subsequent extermination program. One particular turning point in the government's use of terror against cooperatives was the assassination of prominent landowner José Luis Arenas on the premises of his farm, La Perla, on Saturday 7 June 1975. In front of his office there were approximately two to three hundred peasant workers to receive payment. Hidden among the workers were four members of the EGP, who destroyed the communication radio of the farm and executed arenas. Following the assassination, the guerrillas spoke in Ixal language to the farmers, informing them that they were members of the guerrilla army of the poor and had killed the Ixcan Tiger due to his alleged multiple crimes against community members. The attackers then fled towards Chajul, while José Luis Arena's son, who was in San Luis Ixcan at the time, took refuge in a nearby mountain and awaited the arrival of a plane to take him directly to Guatemala City to the Presidential Palace. There he immediately reported the matter to Minister of Defense, General Fernando Romeo Lucas Garcia. Romeo Lucas replied, you are mistaken, there are no guerrillas in the area. 
Despite the defense minister's denial of the presence of guerrillas in Ixcan, the government responded by systematically eliminating many cooperative leaders. Due to the fact that cooperatives had been largely drawn out into the open, the names of cooperativists were relatively easy for the intelligence services G2, to collate in order to designate targets for the subsequent extermination program. On 7 July 1975, one month to the date after the assassination of Arenas, a contingent of army paratroopers arrived in the marketplace of Ixcan Grande. There they seized 30 men who were members of the Zalbal Cooperative and took them away in helicopters, all were subsequently disappeared. The case of the 30 men seized on 7 July, as well as seven other cases of disappearances among the same cooperative were named in a sworn statement to general k gel logarud in november 1975 the ministry of the interior responded by denying that the disappeared persons had been taken by the government in july 1975 the same month the 30 cooperative members were disappeared en masse in Ixcan, a disturbing mimeographed letter sent to Guatemala City cooperatives in the name of the Mano Death Squad, was reported in the press. A total of 60 cooperative leaders were murdered or disappeared in Ixcan between June and December 1975. An additional 163 cooperative and village leaders were assassinated by death squads between 1976 and 1978. Believing that the Catholic Church constituted a major part of the social base of the EGP, the regime also began singling out targets among the catechists. Between November 1976 and December 1977, death squads murdered 143 Catholic action catechists of the Diocese of El Quiche, documented cases of killings and forced disappearances during this time represent a small fraction of the true number of killings by government forces, especially in the indigenous highlands, as many killings of persons went unreported. On 4 February 1976, a devastating 7.5 MW earthquake shook Guatemala. Over 23,000 Guatemalans perished in the disaster and close to a million were left without adequate housing. The earthquake had a political effect as well, the visible incapacity and corruption of the government to deal with the effects of the catastrophe led to a rise in independent organizing and left many survivors deeply critical of the government. The political system was ineffective to ensure the welfare of the populace. In the aftermath of the earthquake, more citizens wanted infrastructural reforms, and many saw it as the government's responsibility to invest in these improvements. In the poor barrios disproportionately affected by the quake, due to poor infrastructure, neighborhood groups helped to rescue victims or dig out the dead, distribute water, food and reconstruction materials, and prevent looting by criminals. The political pressures generated in the aftermath of the earthquake put greater pressure on the military government of Guatemala to induce reforms. The security forces subsequently took advantage of the disorder to engage in a wave of political assassinations in Guatemala City, of which 200 cases were documented by Amnesty International. A period of increased militarization began in the Indian highlands after the earthquake, accompanied by additional counterinsurgency operations. At the same time, the Guatemalan government was becoming increasing isolated internationally. 
In 1977, the administration of U.S. President Jimmy Carter targeted Guatemala and several other Latin American regimes for a reduction in military assistance in pursuance with Section 502B of the Foreign Assistance Act, which stated that no assistance will be provided to a government engages in a consistent pattern of gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. Topic. Transition between Lawgarud and Lucas Garcia regimes Due to his seniority in both the military and economic elites in Guatemala, as well as the fact that he spoke Cuexi perfectly, one of the Guatemalan indigenous languages, Lucas Garcia became the ideal candidate for the 1978 elections, and to further enhance his image, he was paired with the leftist Dr. Francisco Villagrón Kramer as his running mate. Villagrón Kramer was a man of recognized democratic trajectory, having participated in the Revolution of 1944, and was linked to the interests of transnational corporations and elites, as he was one of the main advisors of agricultural, industrial and financial chambers of Guatemala. Despite the democratic facade, the electoral victory was not easy and the establishment had to impose Lucas Garcia, causing further discredit the electoral system which had already suffered a fraud when General Lawgarud was imposed in the 1974 elections. In 1976 student group called FRENTE emerged in the University of San Carlos, which completely swept all student body positions that were up for election that year. FRENTE leaders were mostly members of the Patriotic Workers' Youth, the youth wing of the Guatemalan Labour Party Partido Guatemalteco del Trabajo PGT, the Guatemalan Communist Party who had worked in the shadows since it was illegalized in 1954. Unlike other Marxist organizations in Guatemala at the time, PGT leaders trusted the mass movement to gain power through elections. FRENTE used its power within the student associations to launch a political campaign for the 1978 university general elections, allied with leftist faculty members grouped in University Vanguard. The alliance was effective and Oliverio Castaneda de Leon was elected as president of the student body and Saul Osorio Paz as president of the university, plus they had ties with the University Workers' Union STUSC, through the PGT connections. Osorio Paz gave space and support to the student movement and instead of having a conflictive relationship with students, different representations combined to build a higher education institution of higher social projection. In 1978, the University of San Carlos became one of the sectors with more political weight in Guatemala. That year the student movement, faculty and university governing board Consejo Superior Universitario united against the government and were in favor of opening spaces for the neediest sectors. In order to expand its university extension, the student body AEU rehabilitated the student house in downtown Guatemala City. There, they welcomed and supported families of villages and peasants already sensitized politically. They also organized groups of workers in the informal trade. At the beginning of his tenure as president, Saul Osorio founded the weekly Siete Dias en la USAC, Seven Days in USAC, which, besides reporting on the activities of the university, constantly denounced the violation of human rights, especially the repression against the popular movement. It also told what was happening with revolutionary movements in both Nicaragua and El Salvador. 
For a few months, the State University was a united and progressive institution, preparing to confront the state head-on. Now, FRENTE had to face the radical left, represented then by the Student Revolutionary Front, Robin Garcia, FERG, which emerged during the Labor Day March of the 1st of May 1978. FERG coordinated several student associations on different colleges within University of San Carlos and public secondary education institutions. This coordination between legal groups came from the Guerrilla Army of the Poor EGP, a guerrilla group that had appeared in 1972 and had its headquarters in the oil-rich region of northern Quiche Department i.e., the Ixal Triangle of Ixcan, Nebai and Chajul in Franja Transversal del Norte. Although not strictly an armed group, FERG sought confrontation with government forces all the time, giving prominence to measures that could actually degenerate into mass violence and paramilitary activity. Its members were not interested in working within an institutional framework and never asked permission for their public demonstrations or actions. Topic. Lucas Garcia presidency Romeo Lucas Garcia escalated state terror under guise of repressing leftist rebels but in practice was used to murder civilians. This caused an uprising in the city. Topic. Civil war in the city In response to the increasing number of disappearances and killings, the insurgency began targeting members of the security forces, beginning with the assassination of Juan Antonio El Chino Lima Lopez, a notorious torturer and second in command of the Commando 6 unit of the National Police, on January 15, 1980. On the day of his death, Lima Lopez was sporting a U.S. Army signet ring. The National Police said Lopez, 32, had driven away from his house in downtown Guatemala City when gunmen in another vehicle pulled up next to him and opened fire with automatic rifles, killing him instantly. None of the insurgent groups operating in the Guatemala immediately took responsibility. On the 31st of January 1980, a group of displaced Caiche and Ixal peasant farmers occupied the Spanish embassy in Guatemala City to protest the kidnapping and murder of peasants in Uspain torn by elements of the Guatemalan army. Guatemalan government officials, including the National Police Detective Corps chief, branded them as guerrilleros, collaborators, and subversives, warning people on radio and television not to be fooled by the campesinos' appearance. A special meeting was held in the National Palace by President Romeo Lucas, Col. Germán Chupina Barahona, and Minister of the Interior Donaldo Álvarez Ruiz. Despite pleas by Spanish Ambassador Morshimo Cajal y López to negotiate, a decision was made among General Lucas Garcia's cabinet to forcibly expel the group occupying the embassy. Shortly before noon, about 300 heavily armed state agents cordoned off the area to vehicular traffic and cut the electricity, water and telephone lines. Under the orders from Lieutenant Colonel Pedro Garcia Arredondo, the Commando 6 unit of the National Police proceeded to occupy the first and third floors of the building over the shouts of Ambassador Cajal that they were violating international law in doing so. The peasants barricaded themselves, along with the captive embassy staff and the visiting Guatemalan officials, in the ambassador's office on the second floor. A fire ensued as, Commando 6, prevented those inside of the embassy from exiting the building. In all, 36 people were killed in the fire. 
the funeral of the victims including the father of Rigoberta Menchu, Vicente Menchu attracted hundreds of thousands of mourners, and a new guerrilla group was formed commemorating the date, the Frente Patriotico 31 de Enero Patriotic Front of the 31st of January or FP31. The incident has been called the defining event of the Guatemalan Civil War. The Guatemalan government issued a statement claiming that its forces had entered the embassy at the request of the Spanish ambassador, and that the occupiers of the embassy, whom they referred to as terrorists, had sacrificed the hostages and immolated themselves afterward. Ambassador Cajal denied the claims of the Guatemalan government and Spain immediately terminated diplomatic relations with Guatemala, calling the action a violation of the most elementary norms of international law. Relations between Spain and Guatemala were not normalized until September 22, 1984. The climate of fear maintained by the Lucas government in Guatemala City persisted through 1980 and 1981. Political killings and disappearances of residents were commonplace and ordinary residents lived in terror of the death squads. A coordinated campaign against trade unionists was undertaken by the National Police under Col. German Chupina, who had close ties with the American Chamber of Commerce and with numerous business leaders. The manager of the Coca-Cola franchise in Guatemala City, John C. Trotter from Texas, was apparently a personal friend of Col. Chupina. Trotter would allegedly contact Col. Chupina via telephone regarding the activities of the union at the plant, and many unionists subsequently disappeared or were found dead later. The insurgents had attempted unsuccessfully to assassinate Col. Chupina, as well as Interior Minister Donaldo Álvarez, in February and March 1980. In one incident on June 21, 1980, 60 non uniformed agents, likely from the Detectives Corps, seized and detained 27 members of the National Workers' Union CNT, during an attack on its headquarters, in which uniformed police blocked off the streets surrounding the building. The trade unionists were taken away in unmarked Toyota Jeeps or forced into their own cars and taken away. All 27 members of the CNT seized on that day disappeared while in the custody of the police. Among those abducted were members of the union representing the workers of the Coca-Cola plant under John Trotter, on July 7, 1980, Col. Miguel Angel Natareno Salazar, head of the infamous 4th Corps of the National Police, was assassinated along with his driver and two bodyguards while on his way to work. This was followed by the assassinations of three police agents, two special agents of the Army G2 and a security guard of the Ministry of the Interior in the following week. On August 24, 1980, plainclothes National Police and Army soldiers under the direction of Alfonso Ortiz, the Deputy Chief of the Detectives Corps, abducted 17 Union leaders and a Catholic administrator from a seminar at the Emis Medio Monte, a state belonging to the Diocese of Escuintla, on the southern coast of Guatemala. The detainees were taken to the garages of National Police in Zone 6 of Guatemala City where they were tortured under the direction of the former head of Commando 6, Col. Pedro Garcia Arredondo, who had been promoted to Chief of the Detectives Corps. All 17 Unionists subsequently disappeared after being tortured under Col. Arredondo. On 5 September 1980 the Ejército Guerrillero de los Pobres EGP, carried out a terrorist attack right in front of the Guatemalan National Palace, then the headquarters of the Guatemalan government. The intention was to prevent a huge demonstration that the government had prepared for Sunday 7 September 1980. 
In the attack, six adults and a little boy died after two bombs inside a vehicle went off. There was an undetermined number of wounded and heavy material losses, not only from art pieces from the National Palace, but from all the surrounding buildings, particularly in the Lucky Building, which is right across the presidential office. As killings by government security forces and death squads increased, so did terrorist attacks against private financial, commercial and agricultural targets by the insurgents, who saw those institutions as reactionaries and millionaire exploiters that were collaborating with the genocidal government. The following is a non-exhaustive list of the terrorist attacks that occurred in Guatemala City and are presented in the UN Commission report. Despite advances by the insurgency, the insurgency made a series of fatal strategic errors. The successes made by the revolutionary forces in Nicaragua against the Somoza regime combined with the insurgency's own successes against the Lucas government led rebel leaders to falsely conclude that a military equilibrium was being reached in Guatemala, thus the insurgency underestimated the military strength of the government. The insurgency subsequently found itself overwhelmed on both fronts. On the urban front, the armed forces began to utilize more sophisticated technology to combat the insurgency. With help of advisers from Israel, a computer system was installed in the annex of the EMP behind the presidential palace in 1980. This computer used a data analysis system used to monitor electrical and water usage as a means of pinpointing the coordinates of potential guerrilla safe houses. In the July 1981, tanks and shock troops were mobilized for a massive series of raids to shut down the guerrilla bases operating in the city. 30 ORPA safe houses were raided in Guatemala City in the summer of 1981 according to G2 sources. Large caches of small arms were located in these raids, including 17 American-made M16s which had previously been issued to American units in Vietnam in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Topic. Insurgent mobilization in the countryside The daily number of killings by official and unofficial security forces increased from an average of 20 to 30 in 1979 to a conservative estimate of 30 to 40 daily in 1980. Human rights sources estimated 5,000 Guatemalans were killed by the government for political reasons", in 1980 alone, making Guatemala the worst human rights violator in the hemisphere after El Salvador. In a report titled Guatemala, a government program of political murder, Amnesty International stated between January and November of 1980, some 3,000 people described by government representatives as subversives and criminals were either shot on the spot in political assassinations or seized and murdered later at least 364 others seized in this period have not yet been accounted for with the mass movement being ravaged by covertly sanctioned terror in the cities and brutal army repression in the countryside, its constituents saw no other option than to take up arms against the regime, which led to the growth of the insurgent movement. At the same time the EGP was expanding its presence in the Altiplano, a new insurgent movement called the ORPA Revolutionary Organization of Armed People made itself known. Composed of local youths and university intellectuals, the ORPA developed out of a movement called the Regional de Occidente, which split from the FAR-PGT in 1971. 
The ORPA's leader, Rodrigo Asturias a former activist with the PGT and first-born son of Nobel Prize-winning author Miguel Ángel Asturias, formed the organization after returning from exile in Mexico. The ORPA established an operational base in the mountains and forests above the coffee plantations of southwestern Guatemala and in the Atitlan where it enjoyed considerable popular support. On September 18, 1979, the ORPA made its existence publicly known when it occupied the Mujulia coffee farm in the coffee-growing region of the Quetzaltenango province to hold a political education meeting with the workers. In 1979, the EGP controlled a large amount of territory in the Ixal Triangle and held many demonstrations in Nebai, Chajul, and Kotzal. That year, the owners of La Perla established links with the army, and for the first time, a military detachment was installed within the property. In this same building, the first civil patrol of the area was established. The Army High Command, meanwhile, was very pleased with the initial results of the operation and was convinced it had succeeded in destroying most of the social basis of EGP, which had to be expelled from the Ixal Triangle. Army repression in the region became more intense and less selective than it had been under Lorgarud Garcia. The officers who executed the plan were instructed to destroy all towns suspected of cooperating with EGP and eliminate all sources of resistance. Army units operating in the Ixal Triangle belonged to the Mariscal Zavala Brigade, stationed in Guatemala City. Moreover, although the EGP did not intervene directly when the army attacked the civilian population, allegedly due to a lack of supplies and ammunition, it did support some survival strategies. It streamlined, for example, survival plans designed to give evacuation instructions in assumption that military incursions took place. Most of the population began to participate in the schemes finding that they represented their only alternative to military repression. In December 1979, the Guatemalan army staged a false flag incident in Chajul, ostensibly to justify repressive measures against the city. On 6 December 1979, the Guatemalan army abducted nine peasants from Uspaintorn and transported them to Chajul in a helicopter. Two of the peasants captured by the army managed to escape, while those remaining were dressed in olive drab by the army. After being put in uniform, the peasants were equipped with shotguns and instructed by soldiers to march down a road outside of Chajul. The soldiers then opened fire on the peasants, killing all seven. The army announced that the campesinos were guerrillas, who had attempted to assault the detachment at Chajul. The bodies were later burned and buried. Within three weeks, the army presence in Chajul grew and repression escalated. The repression and excessive force used by the government against the opposition was such that it became source of contention within Lucas Garcia's administration itself. This contention within the government caused Lucas Garcia's vice president Francisco Villagran Kramer to resign from his position on September 1, 1980. In his resignation, Kramer cited his disapproval of the government's human rights record as one of the primary reasons for his resignation. He then went into voluntary exile in the United States, taking a position in the legal department of the Inter American Development Bank. In 1980, armed insurgents assassinated prominent Ixal landowner Enrique Broll, and president of the CACIF, Coordinating Committee of Agricultural, Commercial, Industrial, and Financial Associations, Alberto Habi. In October 1980, a tripartite alliance was formalized between the EGP, the FAR, and the ORPA as a precondition for Cuban backing. In early 1981, the insurgency mounted the largest offensive in the country's history. 
This was followed by an additional offensive towards the end of the year, in which many civilians were forced to participate by the insurgents. Villagers worked with the insurgency to sabotage roads and army establishments, and destroy anything of strategic value to the armed forces. By 1981, an estimated 250,000 to 500,000 members of Guatemala's indigenous community actively supported the insurgency. Guatemalan Army Intelligence G2 estimated a minimum 360,000 indigenous supporters of the EGP alone. Topic: <laughs> List of massacres perpetrated by the EGP in FTN. According to a report by the Reuters magazine, Chronica there were 1258 guerrilla actions against civilians and infrastructure in Guatemala, including more than 200 murders, 68 kidnappings, 11 bombs against embassies and 329 attacks against civilians. Almost all guerrilla massacres occurred in 1982 when further militarization reigned and there was widespread presence of PAC in communities, many of them were victims of non-cooperation with the guerrillas and in some cases they came after a previous attack by the PAC. In the massacres perpetrated by the guerrillas there is no use of informants, or concentration of population, or separation of groups, also, there are no recounts of rape or repetitive slaughter. There are cases of raised villages and less tendency to mass flight, even thought it occurred in some cases. The use of lists was also more frequent. In a publication of the Army of Guatemala, 60 massacres perpetrated by the EGP were reported, arguing that they were mostly ignored by REHMI and the Historical Clarification Commission reports. It is also reported that in mid-1982, 32 members of Star Guerrilla Front were shot for not raising the EGP flag. Topic. Operation Ceniza 1981. Relying on continued material support from the United States and U.S. Allied third parties, the armed forces under Army Chief of Staff, Benedicto Lucas Garcia, the President's brother, known as General Benny, initiated a strategy of scorched earth to separate and isolate the insurgents from the civilian population under the code name Operation Ceniza, Operation Ash, in a strategy developed jointly by Benedicto Lucas Garcia and Lieutenant Col. George Maines, U.S. Defense Attaché and Chief of the U.S. Mill Group in Guatemala, some 15,000 troops were deployed on a gradual sweep through the highlands. By way of a policy of forced recruitment, General Benedicto Lucas began organizing a task force model for fighting the insurgency, by which strategic mobile forces of 3,000 to 5,000 troops were drawn from larger military brigades for search and destroy missions in the highlands. These operations led to massive civilian casualties, numbering in the tens of thousands. The use of genocidal scorched earth tactics radicalized the population, creating antipathy towards the government and causing the ranks of the insurgents to swell to unprecedented levels. Meanwhile, relations between the Guatemalan military establishment and the Lucas Garcia regime worsened. Professionals within the Guatemalan military considered the Lucas approach counterproductive, on grounds that the Lucas government's strategy of military action and systematic terror overlooked the social and ideological causes of the insurgency while radicalizing the civilian population. Additionally, Lucas went against the military's interests by endorsing his defense minister, Angel Aníbal Guevara, as a candidate in the March 1982 presidential elections. Topic: 
Topic: 1982 coup d'état and Reese Mont regime. On 23 March 1982, junior officers under the command of General Efrain Rees-Mont staged a coup d'état and deposed General Romeo Lucas Garcia. The coup was not supported by any entities within the Lucas government aside from the junior officers involved in engineering the coup. At the time of the coup, the majority of Lucas Garcia's senior officers were reportedly unaware of any previous coup plotting on the part of the junior officers or any other entity. General Lucas was reportedly prepared to resist the coup, and could have easily opposed the coup with his own contingent of troops stationed at the presidential palace, but was coerced into surrendering by being shown his mother and sister held with rifles to their heads. After the overthrow of Lucas Garcia, the home of Lucas's interior minister Donaldo Álvarez Ruiz was raided, uncovering a printing press, clandestine jail cells and property taken from police torture victims, including 50 stolen vehicles and scores of gold graduation rings. Within two months after seizing power, Reismont worked to strengthen his personal power and began eliminating those offices which he believed to be involved in counter-coup plotting. One particularly cohesive group of officers opposed to Reese was the Guatemalan Military Academy Promotion Class No. 73. To intimidate these officers and stifle plans for a counter-coup, Reismont ordered the arrest and investigation of three of its most prominent members, Captains Mario López Serrano, Roberto Enrique Latona Hora and Otto Pérez Molina. He threatened to expose evidence of their corruption if they continued to oppose him. On July 9, 1982, Reismont forced two members of the junta to resign, leaving him in complete control of the government, as both the de facto head of the armed forces and Minister of Defense. Topic. Victoria 82 and Operation Sophia The architects of the counterinsurgency program under Rios Mont were aware of the social problems generated by the counterinsurgency under Lucas Garcia. The most counterproductive was the widespread antipathy generated amongst towards the state through indiscriminate mass murder. A compromise was reached between the army's drive to eradicate the insurgency and the desire to win the hearts and minds of the civilian population and new counterinsurgency program known as Victoria 82 was implemented on June 6, 1982. The authors of the plan emphasized that the population's mentality is the principal objective. The program combined the brutal scorched earth tactics developed and executed under Benedicto Lucas Garcia with social welfare programs and government assistance, both to incentivize civilian cooperation with the army and mitigate the negative effects of army massacres. Rees Mont also expanded on the civic action strategy, which began under Benedicto Lucas. The civilian paramilitary bands fielded by Lucas were renamed Civilian Self-Defense Patrols PACs, and the army began conscripting large portions of the rural civilian population into the militias. At the start of the Rios Mont period there were approximately 25,000 civilians in the PACs. In the subsequent 18 months, this number grew to 700,000, due to a policy of forced conscription. Dissenters to the establishment of civil patrols in their villages were often marked for death or other violent reprisal by the army, despite the implementation of social welfare and civil action programs. Victoria 82 still sought first and foremost to destroy the guerrilla forces and their base through operations of annihilation and the scorched earth tactics. As stated in the plan's purpose, 
2 a 1 to 3 the army's job was to defend the population recover members of the irregular local forces Fuertes irregulares locales fill when possible while eliminating subversives who refuse to lay down their weapons Annihilate the clandestine local committees Comités clandestinos locales CCL and the permanent military units Unidades Militares Permanentes UMP of the enemy, although the plan distinguished between the Army's objectives regarding the FIL and the CCL, both groups were local unarmed campesinos living and working in the targeted areas of operation. The FIL were civilians whose routine labors continued. Tending their crops in the field or their domestic responsibilities while they contributed to self defense actions to hinder the Army's activities. The CCL were local leaders, often communitarian authorities, who served as political representatives for the guerrilla. The death of these leaders was a priority for the Army because it signified the end of the political connection between the guerrilla units and their bases of social support. <inaudible> <inaudible> Urban reforms While wholesale killings of indigenous peasants escalated to unprecedented levels in the countryside, death squad killings in the cities decreased a us defense attaché report informed washington in april 1982 that the army intended to act with two sets of rules one to protect and respect the rights of average citizens who lived in secure areas mostly in the cities and had nothing to do with subversion the second set of rules would be applied to the areas where subversion was prevalent. In these areas war zones, the rules of unconventional warfare would apply. Guerrillas would be destroyed by fire and their infrastructure eradicated by social welfare programs." Pursuant with the Army's new set of rules. Rios Mont began to make changes in the intelligence apparatus and disbanded, or renamed, some of the security structures which had become infamous for repression in the capital under previous regimes. In March 1982, shortly after the coup, Rios Mont disbanded the Detectives Corps of the National Police and replaced it with the Department of Technical Investigations. DIT. Additionally, Col. German Chupina Barahona, who was responsible for much of the repression in the capital under Lucas, was forced to resign and Col. Hernan Ponce Nitsch, a former instructor at the U.S. Army School of the Americas, was appointed as Director General of the National Police. Colonel Hector Ismail Montalvan Batters was retained for a period as the chief of the EMP after the coup, due to his experience. Since the insurgency operated in remote rural areas, the application of unconventional warfare became less prevalent in the capital. According to some observers, the decline in extralegal tactics by the National Police and Intelligence Services and the passing of press censorship laws offered the regime some degree of plausible deniability and fostered the misconception on the outside and among city dwellers that political repression was on a downward trend in Guatemala. However, in February 1983, a then confidential CIA cable noted a rise in suspect right-wing violence in the capital, with an increasing number of kidnappings particularly of educators and students and a concomitant increase in the number of corpses recovered from ditches and gullies, previously a characteristic of state terror under the Lucas Garcia regime. The cable traced the wave of death squad repression to an October 1982 meeting by General Rees Mont with the Archivos intelligence unit in which he gave agents full authorization to apprehend, hold, interrogate and dispose of suspected guerrillas as they saw fit. 
This marked the beginning of a gradual return to the conditions which prevailed in Guatemala City under Rios Mont's predecessors. <laughs> Mejia Victores regime and democratic transition, 1983–1986 Rees Mont was deposed on 8 August 1983 by his own Minister of Defense, General Oscar Humberto Mejia Victores. Mejia became de facto president and justified the coup, saying that, "...religious fanatics," were abusing their positions in the government and also because of, "...official corruption." Rees Mont remained in politics, founding the Guatemalan Republican Front Party in 1989. Elected to Congress, he was elected President of Congress in 1995 and 2000. By the time Oscar Humberto Mejia Victores assumed power, the counterinsurgency under Lucas Garcia and Rees Mont had largely succeeded in its objective of detaching the insurgency from its civilian support base. Additionally, Guatemalan military intelligence G2 had succeeded in infiltrating most of the political institutions. It eradicated opponents in the government through terror and selective assassinations. The counterinsurgency program had militarized Guatemalan society, creating a fearful atmosphere of terror that suppressed most public agitation and insurgency. The military had consolidated its power in virtually all sectors of society. In 1983, indigenous activist Rigoberta Menchu published a memoir of her life during that period, I, Rigoberta Menchu, an Indian woman in Guatemala, which gained worldwide attention. She is the daughter of one of the peasant leaders that died in the Spanish Embassy massacre on January 31, 1980. She was later awarded the 1992 Nobel Peace Prize on the year of the fifth centennial celebration of America Discovery for her work in favor of broader social justice. Her memoir drew international attention to Guatemala and the nature of its institutional terrorism. Due to international pressure, as well as pressure from other Latin American nations, General Mejia Victores allowed a gradual return to democracy in Guatemala. On 1 July 1984 an election was held for representatives to a constituent assembly to draft a democratic constitution. On 30 May 1985, the Constituent Assembly finished drafting a new constitution, which took effect immediately. General elections were scheduled, and civilian candidate Vinicio Cerezo was elected as president. The gradual revival of democracy did not end the disappearances and death squad killings, as extrajudicial state violence had become an integral part of the political culture. The Mutual Support Group GAM. On February 18, 1984, student leader Edgar Fernando Garcia disappeared after being seized and dragged into a van on the outskirts of a market near his home in Guatemala City. Fernando Garcia was a trade unionist and member of the outlawed PGT who was studying engineering at the University of San Carlos. The kidnappers were uniformed policemen with the BRO and the 4th Corps of the National Police who were conducting stop and search patrols in the area. Those identified in his kidnapping were policemen Ramirez Reis, Lancerio Gomez, Hugo Rolando Gomez Osorio and Alfonso Guillermo de Leon Marroquín. In the wake of Garcia's kidnapping, his wife, Nineth Montenegro, now a member of Congress, launched the mutual support group, Grupo de Apoyo Matuo. GAM, a new human rights organization that pressed the government for information about missing relatives. 
Co-founded with other families of the disappeared, GAM took shape in June 1984, holding demonstrations, meeting with government officials and leading a domestic and international advocacy campaign over the years to find the truth behind the thousands of Guatemalas disappeared. The organization was quickly joined by hundreds of additional family members of victims of government-sponsored violence, including Mayan Indians affected by the Army's genocidal counterinsurgency sweeps in the late 1970s and early 1980s. In November 1984, the GAM boldly organized a symbolic journey to the Constituent Assembly where they met with the Assembly President to demand information on the whereabouts of their disappeared relatives. After several days, they were received by General Mejia personally. There they repeated their demands for the whereabouts of their missing. A second meeting on 30 November 1984 led to the formation of a government commission to investigate the reports of the GAM's charges. The following month, the GAM met with the Commission. The subsequent inaction of the Commission in the following months led to protest. Topic. Repression against the GAM the military government of General Mejia Victores evinced no real desire to make concessions with the GAM and treated the organization as a front for leftist subversion. This was especially true when the GAM's actions began to attract international attention to the human rights situation in the Republic. On 1 March 1985 the office of the Guatemalan Attorney General was occupied by 100 members of the GAM in protest over the lack of action by the Government Investigative Commission. In the subsequent period the government began to issue warnings to the GAM regarding illegal public protests, starting with a warning from the Interior Minister Gustavo Adolfo López Sandoval to the GAM to cease and desist any protests which blocked public traffic. General Mejia subsequently stated in interviews that he believed the group was being manipulated by leftist forces, on Easter, Holy Week. In March 1985, the government's liquidation units began targeting the GAM's leadership. On 30 March 1985, senior GAM member Hector Gomez Colito was abducted. U.S. Embassy sources reported that Colito had been under surveillance by the Department of Technical Investigations DIT, for some time. His body later appeared bearing signs of torture. Following his murder, GAM co-founder and widow of missing student leader Carlos Ernesto Cuevas Molina, Rosario Godoy de Cuevas, who had delivered the eulogy at Gómez Colito's funeral, was found dead at the bottom of a ditch two miles outside Guatemala City, along with her two-year-old son and 21-year-old brother. All of the three victims' bodies bore signs of extreme torture prior to death. Human rights monitors who had seen the bodies reported that Godoy's two-year-old son's fingernails had been ripped out. While the government claimed their deaths was an accident, embassy sources discounted the official version of the events, and claimed that Godoy was targeted and her death was a premeditated homicide. Topic. Transition to elections In 1985 the United States encouraged civilian rule and elections in Guatemala. When these emerged, Washington proclaimed the birth of democracy in one of its client states. The elections themselves were internationally acclaimed procedurally fair but were also considered deficient in terms of instituting substantive democratic reforms. 
The elections in Guatemala in 1985 and 1990 as well as those in El Salvador in 1982, 1984, 1988, 1989, and 1991 were held against a background of state-sponsored terror that had taken tens of thousands of lives and had disarticulated most mass-based civic and political organizations. Candidates perforce came mainly from center to far right parties, and independent or critical media outlets were non existent. Repression confined most citizen participation in formal national politics to voting. Only a tiny minority of center and right wing party activists engaged in campaigns, and repression kept turnout low. Historian Suzanne Jonas writes that for the most part from 1986 through 1995, civilian presidents allowed the army to rule from behind the scenes. After an initial decline, death squad violence and other abuses by the army had actually increased significantly in the late 1980s. Cerezo administration. Vinicio Cerezo, a civilian politician and the presidential candidate of the Guatemalan Christian Democracy, won the first election held under the new constitution with almost 70% of the vote, and took office on 14 January 1986. Upon its inauguration in January 1986, President Cerezo's civilian government announced that its top priorities would be to end the political violence and establish the rule of law. Reforms included new laws of habeas corpus and amparo, court-ordered protection, the creation of a legislative human rights committee, and the establishment in 1987 of the Office of Human Rights Ombudsman. The Supreme Court also embarked on a series of reforms to fight corruption and improve legal system efficiency. With Cerezo's election, the military moved away from governing and returned to the more traditional role of providing internal security, specifically by fighting armed insurgents. The first two years of Cerezo's administration were characterized by a stable economy and a marked decrease in political violence. Dissatisfied military personnel made two coup attempts in May 1988 and May 1989, but military leadership supported the constitutional order. The government was heavily criticized for its unwillingness to investigate or prosecute cases of human rights violations. The final two years of Cerezo's government also were marked by a failing economy, strikes, protest marches, and allegations of widespread corruption. The government's inability to deal with many of the nation's problems, such as infant mortality, illiteracy, deficient health and social services, and rising levels of violence, contributed to popular discontent. Presidential and congressional elections were held on the 11th of November 1990. After the second round ballot, Jorge Antonio Serrano Elias was inaugurated on 14 January 1991, thus completing the first transition from one democratically elected civilian government to another. Because his movement of Solidarity Action Mass Party gained only 18 of 116 seats in Congress, Serrano entered into a tenuous alliance with the Christian Democrats and the National Union of the Center The Serrano administration's record was mixed. It had some success in consolidating civilian control over the army, replacing a number of senior officers and persuading the military to participate in peace talks with the URNG. He took the politically unpopular step of recognizing the sovereignty of Belize, which until then had been officially, though fruitlessly, claimed by Guatemala. The Serrano government reversed the economic slide it inherited, reducing inflation and boosting real growth. Topic: 
Topic: <laughs> Serrano government dissolution and recovery. On 25 May 1993, Serrano illegally dissolved Congress and the Supreme Court and tried to restrict civil freedoms, allegedly to fight corruption. The Autogolp or Autoku failed due to unified, strong protests by most elements of Guatemalan society, international pressure, and the Army's enforcement of the decisions of the Court of Constitutionality, which ruled against the attempted takeover. Serrano fled the country. An intelligence oversight board report, secret at the time, states that the CIA helped in stopping this autocoup. Pursuant to the 1985 Constitution, the Guatemalan Congress on the 5th of June 1993 elected De Leon, the human rights ombudsman, to complete Serrano's presidential term. He was not a member of any political party, lacking a political base but with strong popular support, he launched an ambitious anti-corruption campaign to «purify» Congress and the Supreme Court, demanding the resignations of all members of the two bodies. Shortly after he took office, his cousin, leader of the Liberal Party and two-time presidential candidate, was assassinated. Despite considerable congressional resistance, presidential and popular pressure led to a November 1993 agreement brokered by the Catholic Church between the administration and Congress. This package of constitutional reforms was approved by popular referendum on 30 January 1995. In August 1994, a new Congress was elected to complete the unexpired term. Controlled by the anti-corruption parties, the Populist Guatemalan Republican Front FRG, headed by Rees Montt, and the center-right National Advancement Party PAN, the new Congress began to move away from the corruption that characterized its predecessors. Topic. Renewed peace process 1994-1996 Under de Leon, the peace process, now brokered by the United Nations, took on new life. The government and the URNG signed agreements on human rights March 1994, resettlement of displaced persons June 1994, historical clarification June 1994, and indigenous rights March 1995. They also made significant progress on a socio-economic and agrarian agreement. National elections for President, Congress, and municipal offices were held in November 1995. With almost 20 parties competing in the first round, the presidential election came down to a 7 January 1996 runoff in which PAN candidate Álvaro Arzu Irigoyen defeated Alfonso Portillo Cabrera of the FRG by just over 2% of the vote. Arzu won because of his strength in Guatemala City, where he had previously served as mayor, and in the surrounding urban area. Portillo won all of the rural departments except Petén. Under the Arzu administration, peace negotiations were concluded, and the government and the guerrilla umbrella organization URNG, which became a legal party, signed peace accords ending the 36-year internal conflict in December 1996. The General Secretary of the URNG, Comandante Rolando Moron, and President Álvaro Arzu jointly received the UNESCO Peace Prize for their efforts to end the civil war and attaining the peace agreement. The United Nations Security Council adopted Resolution 1094 on 20 January 1997 deploying military observers to Guatemala to monitor the implementation of the peace agreements. Topic. Casualties 
By the end of the war, it is estimated that 140,000 to 200,000 people had been killed or had disappeared. The overwhelming majority of those killed in human rights abuses were victims of official sanctioned terror by government forces. The internal conflict is described in the report of the Archbishop's Office for Human Rights ODHAG. ODHAG attributed almost 90.0% of the atrocities and over 400 massacres to the Guatemalan army and paramilitary, and less than 5% of the atrocities to the guerrillas, including 16 massacres. In a report in 1999, the UN-sponsored Historical Clarification Commission CEH, stated that the state was responsible for 93% of the human rights violations committed during the war, the guerrillas for 3%. They peaked in 1982. 83% of the victims were Maya. Both sides used terror as a deliberate policy. Topic. Foreign support and involvement Topic. United States involvement Declassified CIA documents report that the U.S. government organized, funded, and equipped the 1954 coup d'état, deposing the elected Guatemalan presidential government of Jacobo Orbenz Guzmán. Analysts Kate Doyle and Peter Cornblue report that after a small insurgency developed, in the wake of the coup, Guatemala's military leaders developed and refined, with U.S. assistance, a massive counter-insurgency campaign that left tens of thousands of massacred, maimed or missing, people. History professor Stephen G. Rabe, reports that in destroying the popularly elected government of Jacobo Arbenz Guzman (1950–1954), the United States initiated a nearly four-decade-long cycle of terror and repression. The coup d'état installed lead usurper Colonel Castillo Armas as head of government, and then he and the United States began to militarize Guatemala almost immediately, financing and reorganizing the police and military. <laughs> U.S. changes approach The report by the Historical Clarification Commission CEH shows that the United States institutionalized its national security doctrine in nearly every country in Latin America. In Guatemala, this strategy was first implemented as anti-reformist, then anti-democratic policies, culminating in criminal counterinsurgency. In 1962, the Kennedy administration shifted the mission of the armies in Latin America, including Guatemala, from hemispheric defense to internal security. Charles Meachling, Jr., who led U.S. counterinsurgency and internal defense planning from 1961 to 1966, explains the results of this new initiative as a shift from toleration of the rapacity and cruelty of the Latin American military, to direct complicity in their crimes, to U.S. support for the methods of Heinrich Himmler's extermination squads. U.S. <laughs> training Also in 1962, Guatemalan specialist Suzanne Jonas has alleged that U.S. Special Forces set up a secret military training base. After a successful US backed coup against President Miguel Idigoras Fuentes in 1963, U.S. advisors began to work with Colonel Carlos Manuel Arana Osorio to defeat the guerrillas, borrowing extensively from current counterinsurgency strategies and technology being employed in Vietnam." 
In subsequent years, Irana earned the nickname, Butcher of Zashapa, for killing 15,000 peasants to eliminate 300 suspected rebels. After July 1966, when President Julio César Méndez Montenegro signed a pact permitting the army to pursue a more aggressive counterinsurgency program, there was an influx of American military and security advisers in Guatemala. Up to 1,000 U.S. Green Berets were estimated to be operating in Zashapa during the 1966–68 period, providing training and support for Guatemalan counterinsurgency operations. Jonas claims that the ratio of military advisors to local military officials in Guatemala was the highest of any Latin American country in the late 1960s and 70s, and moreover that, "...there is substantial evidence of the direct role of U.S. military advisors in the formation of death squads." U.S. Embassy personnel were allegedly involved in writing an August 1966 memorandum outlining the creation of paramilitary groups, and the U.S. military attaché during this period publicly claimed credit for instigating their formation as part of counterterror operations. Topic. Lessons for U.S. counterinsurgency in Vietnam A retrospective analysis of U.S. government biographic register and foreign service lists revealed that many of the same U.S. personnel operating in Guatemala during the 1960s and 70s also served in South Vietnam, particularly in civil operations and revolutionary development support cords. A component of CORDS was the Phoenix Program 1968-72, which was in part a covert program of selective assassination aimed at eradicating the Viet Cong's civilian support base which killed at least 41,000 suspected VC sympathizers and cadre according to South Vietnamese government statistics. The strategies introduced by the United States to South Vietnam during the Phoenix Program were near nearly identical to those which were already been being employed in Guatemala at the time with U.S. support. Central to the Phoenix program was the use of death squads, known euphemistically as Provincial Reconnaissance Units PRUs. These units would kill or abduct or neutralize suspected NLF cadre and sympathizers. Suspects were then taken to interrogation centers where they were tortured in an attempt to gain intelligence on VC activities in the area. The information extracted was used to task the death squads with further killings, numerous eyewitnesses to killings and disappearances by state actors in Guatemala described Phoenix-style tactics being used by the army to ferret out suspects among the peasantry. In rural Guatemala, as in Vietnam, blacklists or hooded informants were often used to identify suspected insurgents among the villagers who were subsequently massacred or seized and disappeared. Topic: <laughs> Carter administration. In 1977, the Carter administration published a report citing the Guatemalan government as a gross and consistent human rights violator, while noting that the situation was improving under the administration of President K. Gel Eugenio Logarud Garcia. Angered by this report, the Logarud government renounced all U.S. military assistance on the 11th of March 1977. Congress then reduced military aid to Guatemala for that year and prohibited military aid after 1978. Despite the prohibition, covert and overt U.S. support for the Guatemalan Army continued as the administration continued to send equipment to Guatemala through the CIA or reclassified military items as non-military. 
In fiscal years 1978, 1979 and 1980, the three years for which the Carter administration can be held responsible, the U.S. delivered approximately $8.5 million in direct military assistance to Guatemala, mostly foreign military sales credits, as well as export licensing for commercial arms sales worth $1.8 million, a rate which differs very little from that of the Nixon Ford administrations. According to Elias Barahona, former press secretary for the Ministry of Home Affairs in Guatemala from 1976 to 1980, the United States also worked closely with the government of General Romeo Lucas Garcia on the development of anti guerrilla strategies through the Program for the Elimination of Communism. This was also confirmed by several other senior civil servants who worked under Lucas Garcia. Additionally, the reaction of U.S. policymakers in multilateral lending institutions was at best ambiguous during the Carter administration, and economic and financial aid continued to reach Guatemala. The U.S. only voted against two of seven multilateral development bank loans for Guatemala between October 1979 and May 1980. In August 1980, it was reported that the U.S. had reversed its position entirely on multilateral development assistance to Guatemala. At that time, the U.S. refused to veto a $51 million loan from the IDB that was earmarked for government use in the turbulent Quiche area of northern Guatemala. Topic. Reagan increases military assistance and cooperation After the election of Ronald Reagan, the U.S. undertook more active measures to ensure close relations with the Guatemalan government. In April 1981, President Reagan's national security team agreed to supply military aid to the Guatemalan regime in order to exterminate leftist guerrillas and their civilian support mechanisms. According to a document from the National Archives, the U.S. provided military logistical support to the Guatemalan Army, which was reclassified as non-military regional stability controls to circumvent the congressional embargo. Such aid included a $3.2 million shipment of 150 jeeps and trucks and shipments of three Bell 212 and six Bell 412 helicopters, worth $10.5 million, which were reportedly indispensable to the Guatemalan Army's capacity to transport its troops into the highlands for counterinsurgency sweeps. Lieutenant Col. George Maines, former U.S. defense attaché and chief of the U.S. Mill Group in Guatemala, also worked with Guatemalan Army Chief of Staff Benedicto Lucas Garcia in the planning and development of the counterinsurgency program which was implemented by the Lucas Garcia regime in the Highlands in late 1981 and early 1982. Maines had close relations with General Benedicto Lucas, functioning as an advisor in counterinsurgency matters. In an interview with investigative journalist Alan Nairn, Lt. Col. Maines stated that Benedicto Lucas consulted with him on a regular basis. USAID assisted the Army's model village or resettlement camp programs there as well. When General Efrain Rios Mont seized power in 1982, the administration saw an opportunity to justify additional aid for Guatemala, including a $4 million shipment of helicopter spare parts. In October 1982, it was discovered that the U.S. Army Special Forces were instructing Guatemalan Army cadets in a wide range of counterinsurgency tactics at the Escuela Politécnica, the Guatemalan Army's main officer training school. Captain Jesse Garcia, a 32-year-old Green Beret interviewed by the New York Times during a training exercise in October 1982, described his work in Guatemala as, "...not much different," 
than that of U.S. advisers in El Salvador. The U.S. Special Forces had been operating in Guatemala since at least 1980 under the guise of the Personnel Exchange Program, and were officially classified as English instructors. The curriculum offered to Guatemalan cadets by the U.S. Special Forces during this period included training in surveillance, small arms, artillery, demolitions, ambushes, helicopter assault tactics, and how to destroy towns. Another U.S. Green Beret interviewed by the New York Times, Major Larry Salmon, who had operated in Guatemala from 1980 to 1982, described how he had helped the Guatemalans plan their tactical training and had given course instructions to the Guatemalan Army Parachute Brigade. By 1983, it was also confirmed that Guatemalan military officers were once again being trained at the U.S. School of the Americas in Panama. In early 1982, with authorization from the State Department and the Pentagon, ten American made M41 Walker Bulldog light tanks were illegally delivered to Guatemala by ASCO, a Belgian company, at a cost of U.S. $34 million. The 10 tanks were part of a U.S. government-authorized shipment of 22 tanks from Belgium to the Dominican Republic. Only 12 of the tanks were unloaded and the remainder were shipped to the Guatemalan military in Puerto Barrios on the Caribbean coast. Topic. Reagan administration dismisses reports of human rights abuses. Human Rights Watch in 1984 criticized U.S. President Ronald Reagan for his December 1982 visit to Rees Mont in Honduras, where Reagan dismissed reports of human rights abuses by prominent human rights organizations while insisting that Rees Mont was receiving a bum rap. Human Rights Watch reported that soon after, the Reagan administration announced that it was dropping a five-year prohibition on arms sales and moreover had "...approved a sale of $6.36 million worth of military spare parts." to Rios Mont and his forces. Human Rights Watch described the degree of U.S. responsibility thus, in light of its long record of apologies for the government of Guatemala, and its failure to repudiate publicly those apologies even at a moment of disenchantment, we believe that the Reagan administration shares in the responsibility for the gross abuses of human rights practiced by the government of Guatemala. In January 1983, shortly after President Reagan's bum rap, Comment, Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights Elliot Abrams went on television to defend the announced resumption of military aid, the army massacres and the ensuing refugee flows should be blamed. On the guerrillas who are fighting the government. He said. Massacres and refugees are. The price of stability. As opposition to U.S. policy grew, the London Economist, three months later observed, what liberal Americans can reasonably expect is that a condition of military help to Guatemala should be an easing of the political persecution of the center, which played into the hands of the extreme left in the first place. Topic. Support for army intelligence. The CEH's coordinator, Christian Tomuschat, stated that until the mid-1980s the United States government and U.S.-based multinationals exerted strong pressures to maintain the country's archaic and unjust socioeconomic structures. In addition, he said, U.S. intelligence agencies, including the CIA, provided direct and indirect support to some illegal state operations. 
In the 1980s and 1990s, the CIA employed the Army's death squad chiefs as informants and supplied them with intelligence on guerrillas, farmers, peasants, and other opponents, among them, Colonel Julio Roberto Alpare, base commander of the Military Intelligence Section G2. Alpare discussed in an interview how the CIA helped advise and to run G2. He claimed that U.S. agents trained G2 men. Alpare described attending CIA sessions at G2 bases on contra subversion tactics and how to manage factors of power to fortify democracy. He said the CIA officials were on call to respond to G2 questions, and that the G2 often consulted the agency on how to deal with political problems. The agency also helped to provide technical assistance, including communications equipment, computers and special firearms, as well as collaborative use of CIA-owned helicopters that were flown out of a Piper hangar at La Aurora Civilian Airport and from a separate U.S. air facility. The CIA also supplied the Guatemalan Army and G2 with civil material assistance", which included medical supplies, Vietnam-era metal jeep parts, compasses, and walkie-talkies. When asked to summarize the CIA's relations with the Army Intelligence Directorate D2, one D2 commander stated, it's quite simple and I won't deny it, between the 1960s and 1990s, we had a structure from the CIA. The money, the resources, the training, and the relations were all from and through the CIA. This was the case because our intelligence, in the end, has had to serve the interests of the U.S. An Intelligence Oversight Board report from 1996 writes that military aid was stopped during the Carter administration but later resumed under the Reagan administration, "...after a civilian government under President Cerezo was elected in 1985, overt non-lethal U.S. military aid to Guatemala resumed." In December 1990, however, largely as a result of the killing of U.S. citizen Michael Devine by members of the Guatemalan Army, the Bush administration suspended almost all overt military aid. The funds the CIA provided to the Guatemalan liaison services were vital to the D-2 and Archivos. The CIA continued this aid after the termination of overt military assistance in 1990. Overall CIA funding levels to the Guatemalan services dropped consistently from about $3.5 million in FY 1989 to about $1 million in 1995. The report writes that the CIA's liaison relationship with the Guatemalan services also benefited U.S. interests by enlisting the assistance of Guatemala's primary intelligence and security service, the Army's Directorate of Intelligence D2, in areas such as reversing the «auto-coup» of 1993. In the face of strong protests by Guatemalan citizens and the international community including the United States and, most importantly, in the face of the Guatemalan army's refusal to support him, President Serrano's Fujimori-style failed. U.S. role in torture It is unknown to what degree American military and intelligence personnel participated directly in torture and human rights abuses, however, a number of survivors of torture in Guatemala attest to U.S. personnel participating or being present during torture sessions. 
Sister Diana Ortiz is an American Roman Catholic nun and the founder of the human rights advocacy group, the Torture Abolition and Survivors Support Coalition International In 1989, while she was working as a missionary in Guatemala, she was kidnapped, tortured, and raped by state security agents. She identified the leader of the unit as a North American with the U.S. Embassy. On a trip to Guatemala in 1999 after the publication of the Truth Commission report, U.S. President Bill Clinton issued an apology declaring that it is important that I state clearly that support for military forces or intelligence units which engaged in violent and widespread repression of the kind described in the report was wrong. Topic: Israeli support. During the Central American crisis, the Israeli government cooperated closely with the United States in opposing human rights and providing supplementary military and intelligence support for U.S.-backed regimes in the region. This was especially true in Guatemala after 1977, when U.S. support became subject to constraints stemming from the rising tensions between Guatemala and Belize and congressional opposition to the Guatemalan government's human rights practices. While the CIA and the U.S. Green Berets continued to function covertly in Guatemala, providing training and counterinsurgency advice, a critical aspect of American support involved outsourcing operations to proxies such as Israel and Argentina. In a declassified National Security Council memo dated 1 August 1983, NSC aides Oliver North and Alfonso Sapia Bosch reported to National Security Advisor William P. Clark that his deputy Robert McFarlane was planning to exploit Israeli intelligence networks to secretly arrange for the loan of 10 UH-1H. Huey helicopters to Guatemala, which lacked the FMS foreign military sales credits to obtain the helicopters. The memo reads, "...with regard to the loan of ten helicopters, it is our understanding that Bud Robert McFarlane will take this up with the Israelis. There are expectations that they would be forthcoming." By 1983, the New York Times reported that Israel was not only acting as a surrogate for the United States in a similar fashion to its actions in Nicaragua, but also working to oppose the Soviet Union and grow the market for Israeli arms. The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute calculates that 39% of Guatemala's weapons imports between 1975 and 1979 were from Israel. These shipments included Galil automatic rifles, IMI Uzi submachine guns, FN MAG general purpose machine guns, IAI Arava STOL aircraft, RBY MK1 armored cars, patrol boats, field kitchens, and large quantities of ammunition. Numerous sources, including the Israeli press, estimated that up to 300 Israeli advisers were operating in Guatemala. The nature of Israel's advisory role in Guatemala included training in intelligence and surveillance and courses in urban counterinsurgency. With funding from USAID, Israeli specialists, acting as subcontractors for the United States, held torture workshops with the Contras in Guatemala, Nicaragua and Honduras. High-ranking officers from Guatemala also attended courses in interrogation in Tel Aviv, also with funds from USAID, though primarily a proxy for the United States. Impact of Israeli training and the role of Israeli advisers in prosecuting the war during this period was publicly emphasized numerous times by top-ranking Guatemalan military officials during the 1980s. In 1981, Guatemalan Army Chief of Staff General Benedicto Lucas Garcia, the architect of the Guatemalan Army's scorched earth 
policy, proclaimed that the Israeli soldier is the model for our soldiers. In a 1982 interview with ABC News, General Efra Ein Rees Mont attributed the success of his coup to the fact that his soldiers were trained by Israelis. General Rodolfo Lobo Zamora, a leading military official during the conflict, mentioned the United States, Israel, and Argentina as countries that spontaneously offered military aid Guatemala. Despite some public praise for Israel, some Guatemalan officials were nonetheless critical of Israel's role. General Hector Gramajo stated in an interview, maybe some Israelis taught us intelligence but for reasons of business, the Hawks Israeli arms merchants took advantage of us, selling us equipment at triple the price. Argentine support Military regimes in the South American Southern Cone also provided material support and training to the Guatemalan government, in a manner similar to the State of Israel. Many of the tactics used by the Guatemalan security forces were similar to those employed during Operation Condor, especially those used by Argentina during the Dirty War. The military junta in Argentina was a prominent source of both material aid and inspiration to the Guatemalan military, especially during the final two years of the Lucas government. Argentina's involvement with the Guatemalan government fit within the broader context of Operation Charlie, a CIA-backed covert operation aimed at providing intelligence training and counterinsurgency assistance to the governments in El Salvador, Honduras and Guatemala as a supplement to U.S. operations in the region. In October 1981, the Guatemalan government and the Argentine military junta formalized secret accords which augmented Argentine participation in government counterinsurgency operations. As part of the agreement, 200 Guatemalan officers were dispatched to Buenos Aires to undergo advanced military intelligence training, which included instruction in interrogation. Argentine involvement had initially begun in 1980, when the Videla regime dispatched army and naval officers to Guatemala to assist in counterinsurgency activities, under contract from President Romeo Lucas Garcia. In addition to working with the regular security forces, Argentine military advisers as well as a squadron of the notorious Battalion de Inteligencia 601 Argentina's elite special forces battalion, worked directly with the Lucas government's paramilitary death squads, most notably the Ejército Secreto Anticomunista ESA. Argentine military advisers also participated in the Guatemalan Army's rural counteroffensive in 1981 during Operation Ash 81. Argentina's collaboration with the governments in Central America came to an end during the Falklands War in 1982. Israel was the principal supplier of military hardware to Argentina from late 1978 onward after the United States suspended aid to the Argentine military junta. The government in Argentina also supplied quantities of Israeli manufactured weapons and hardware to the Guatemalan military on several occasions. Argentina participated with the U.S. and other countries to provide training to officers from Guatemala and elsewhere in Central America. A defector from Battalion 3 to 16 in Honduras, José Federico Val, described his training in intelligence in 1980. Val was one of 120 trainees from several Central American countries who attended courses offered by American, Argentine, Chilean and Panamanian advisors. Among these trainees were 60 to 70 officers from El Salvador and Guatemala. Topic. 
South African support The military regime in Guatemala maintained close ties with apartheid South Africa, with which the regime exchanged intelligence methods and techniques. South Africa provided the Guatemalan government with military advice and training in counterinsurgency tactics based on those the SADF and paramilitary forces such as the COAFIT employed in Namibia. In early 1983, Guatemalan officers traveled to South Africa and Namibia to study first-hand South African techniques being employed against the SWAPO independence movement, particularly those used in isolating the SWAPO from its civilian infrastructure. Also of interest to Guatemalan intelligence was the South African experience in fighting Cuban forces in Angola. Material support was provided by South Africa as well. Sources reported as early as 1981 that South Africa was assisting the Lucas regime in the construction of an armaments factory in Guatemala. In November 1984, high-ranking South African generals L.B. Erasmus and Alexander Popgeiter headed an SADF delegation to Guatemala which toured Guatemalan military bases and installations and held talks with high-ranking officials of the Mejia Victoria's government to discuss continued military aid. Topic. See also Salvadoran Civil War Blessed Archbishop Oscar Romero Colombian Armed Conflict List of Civil Wars MINUGUA, United Nations Verification – Peacekeeping Mission in Guatemala, 1994–2004 Guatemala National Police Archives Assassinated Catholic priests in Guatemala Blessed Reverend F.R. Stanley Rother <laughs> <laughs> Notes <laughs>